Hi, HR Nation. It's Chris Rainey. Welcome to HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most successful and innovative HR practitioners five days a week. Today, we have a very special guest. We're joined by Jeffrey Moore. Uh, Jeffrey is an author, speaker, and advisor who splits his consulting time between startup companies and established high-tech enterprises such as Salesforce, Microsoft, Intel, Cognizant, the list goes on. <laughs> um, Jeffrey, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm very, very well. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for taking the time out to, to join us. Um, Jeffrey, for people that aren't aware of your work, fill in the gaps. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to, to where we are today. Well, it's actually an interesting HR journey because it has two parts. I started as an English professor, so I got a doctorate in medieval and Renaissance English literature. I went off to be an English professor. But at the age of 32, my wife and I and our young children wanted to move back to California, and there was not going to be any openings in academics. So I, I joined a software company as a training director uh, and w worked in the HR function and then moved into sales and then moved into marketing. And in 86, I joined a high-tech marketing consulting firm uh, run by a guy named Regis McKenna, who was the, sort of the iconic marketing uh, guru of that time. And that was where I was able to see a lot of different companies ch confronting a challenge of how do you market disruptive innovations? How do, you, how do you create a market for something for which there had been no market? And that was fascinating work. And that led me to write a book called Crossing the Chasm. And that came out in 1990. And that book is still in print. It's in its third edition. It's sold over a million copies. It, it just simply is a framework for understanding how markets uh, develop under the, under the pressure or under the opportunity of a disruptive innovation. That book led to other books. It led me to form consulting firms. Uh, over the past uh, you know, 30 years, we've been, we've been consulting primarily with high tech companies. But the most interesting, and, and originally it was around the startups challenge. Mm -hmm. and, but in, in, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've been working more with larger companies who are more likely to be the disruptee than the disruptor. <laughs> uh, they still have to deal with disruptive innovation, right? They still, have to, they still have to invest in it. But how do you do that? And the latest book called Zone to Win is specifically for how do you make that journey if you have to fund it out of your own earnings as opposed to from venture capital? Because it turns out that it creates a crisis of prioritization, mm -hmm. and it's one that's brought many a large company to a standstill. And so, um, you know, the, the idea was how, how, do, how do you manage that? And how do you manage through that financially, but also in, the, in terms of the listeners for this podcast, how do you manage through it culturally? Fantastic. And uh, I was going to ask you what your area of expertise is, but I think you've answered that question there. <laughs> okay. okay. I, mean, I, I think in general, my, I mean, I, I spend most of my time with management teams who are <clears throat> really well grounded in the disciplines necessary to run to run their existing businesses, but who are come from very different paths to disruptive innovation. And so they often have trouble creating a common framework, a common frame of reference. And until they get a common frame of reference, they often act at cross purposes. And so part of my goal is to, is to just get the company realized. I think of myself sometimes organizational chiropractor, just trying uh -huh. to get the organization real, aligned with itself. That's a great analogy. <laughs> so the companies that you work with and what you've been doing, how, how do companies succeed in this disruptive, connected, fast-paced world that we're in right now? Where do you start when you start working with these organizations? Well, we have this, I think the first thing we, we want to do is to acknowledge that if you are going to take on disruptive innovation in, the, in an established, from the point of view of an established enterprise, you are going to have to reprioritize resources in a way that will be very painful because you're going to have to take resources away from the existing business where they're very efficiently used and, and generate very profitable results, albeit in a category that is losing momentum, and put it into a category that's gaining momentum but is not yet efficient. And so basically you just lose all that money. And if in your financial results, you're, they start going the wrong way and, and your investors get nervous, your board of directors, et cetera. So the first thing to understand is that that pressure is endemic to the process and we have to start there. So under that pressure, we, we, the next thing to do is to understand you have different interest groups in the, in the company. We have this model called the four zones. And each zone has its own mandate and its own culture. And from an HR point of view, this is really important because each zone has a different culture and, and th that culture works extremely well in its zone and the metrics that measure that culture work very well in that zone, but they don't work in the other three. And, and the, the trouble most companies get into is when they try to take the culture and metrics of one zone and impose it on another zone. 
So what are the four zones? Well, they're very simple. One, we call it the performance zone. It's where you run your existing business. You measure it by all the classic financial metrics. You make your numbers. It's all the stuff that investment analyst people look at. It's the one, it's also, by the way, the zone where you deliver your value to the world. So really, it's the most important of the four zones by far, because this is where you do your work. It's supported by a second zone called the productivity zone. That's where HR is, it's where finance is, it's where legal, IT, it's all the cost center functions. You don't charge your customers for them, but if you didn't do them, you couldn't be in business together. And those two zones are probably 95% of the budget. I mean, it's, 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 it's yeah, the bulk of the company, right? Mm -hmm. And then the third zone we call the incubation zone. And that's a place where you, 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 you separate away from the company because you wanna do things in that zone that are not compatible with the existing business processes or, 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 the, or, or with the existing uh, customer base or whatever. So you say, okay, well, let's, let's take, either we're gonna invest in startups or we'll create a little incubation zone or a Y Combinator, we'll do something uh, to, create, to create innovation. And, and mo it used to be only tech had that, but these days, industry after industry is saying, no, we can't let Amazon take us in retail. We can't let Netflix take us in media. So they'll create their own incubation zone. And everybody agrees that the rules there are different. Okay? It's, 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 it, but it's more than a laboratory. You're actually experimenting with new businesses. Sometimes you acquire a small company and put it in the incubation zone. So those three zones have very different cultures. I, I tease sometimes that each zone feels slightly superior to the other two zones. So if you talk to people in the incubation zone, they usually think they're smarter than you are. And, you know, they, and the people in the performance zone will remind you they're the people paying for everything after all. So, you know, they're the important ones. And usually the people in the productivity zone are trying to say, like, are we the only adults in the room? I mean, what? But, but all three zones kind of get along with each other. But then the fourth zone, which it does not normally exist, is called the transformation zone. And that's when the company says, we need now to shift our center of gravity from our traditional category into the new business. And when you do that, you've got to take sales resources, marketing resources, services resources that are very productively employed in the current business, take them out of that role, or at least take the funding away and the headcount away and put it into the new role where they will be struggling, inefficient, you don't yet, the customers don't quite have budget for the new stuff, you don't have partners yet that work, your products are immature, it's a very, very painful journey. It's probably going to last for two years, maybe two to three years. So, and, and, and during that time, your financial results are going to look bad. Mm -hmm. and, and so having, how do you do that? And what we've decided, what we've all said is that that culture has to be a command and control culture when you're in the transformation zone. The CEO must lead in, in a very authoritarian way because you cannot have anybody rowing in the wrong direction. And, and the entire company, not just, the, not just the new business, every employee of the entire enterprise has to support and make a, the number one priority this transformation transition, which is, requires a lot of self-sacrifice. And frankly, in most companies, we never, nobody ever asked, set it up that way. So what happens in most companies is that people go on with their current business, the transformation starts, it gets some traction, it gets to a certain point, it's not getting enough support, it starts to waver, and people quit. And so you go, you go into these transformations, but don't come out. And after you do that two or three or four or five times, you destroy your company. And that mm -hmm. unfortunately has been the track record in high tech for a long time. I can see that in all companies now. Um, just that what I speak to HR leaders every day, you have to manage that transition. And I hear stories on across every single industry now, as you said, it used to be just the finance and the tech. And now it's every organization. Uh, is experience I, well, in that. One of the things that's important is there's a tendency to want to make one zone more right than the other zones, somehow more correct, more enlightened, more whatever. That's not true. Each zone is totally legitimate in its own concerns. The performance zone is totally legitimate in its concerns about current, the current year's earnings. The productivity zone is totally legitimate in its concern with process and compliance and order. And the incubation zone is totally right about being excited about the, breaking all the rules. And the transformation zone says it's, it's, a, it's a mandate, but you cannot make one. The only thing is during a transformation, you must make that zone super, super being the other three. Mm -hmm. And that is the CEO's job. And often the CEO has not taken the reins. The CEO has said, well, I'll leave that to the executive vice president leading the new initiative. No, you won't. No, because the entire corporation has to make sacrifices, not just 
not just that one business. Yeah. So when you're going through this, how do you connect those zones together? You know, what does the relationship need to look like for it to succeed? Because I can see that's already going to be a point of failure if they're not the communication between all parties isn't into going in the same direction. So I think the forum for the zones coming together is the executive staff meeting and led by the CEO. And, and normally, if you say we're not going through a transformation, you often can have those zones meet, meet infrequently as a, as a group. So, for example, you know, the performance zone will have typically a, a monthly operational meeting and a quarterly business review about the numbers. The productivity zone probably doesn't need to meet that often, um, but, but and it has a lot of its own internal meetings, and it will, it will support the, the quarterly business reviews with the performance zone. The incubation zone, frankly, you can manage completely outboard of the entire system. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of let it get going, uh, and as long as as long as we're operating somewhat independently, you're fine. When you lead a transformation, all of a sudden, all four zone leaders have to meet, probably well, initially at least once a month. Uh, it, let's just take over the executive committee meeting for 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 the time being. And in that meeting, the first question is, the 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 CEO has to ask the transformational initiative leader, what can we do to accelerate this transformation? Because None of us in this room are happy until this thing is done. So the faster we get to it, the better. And then whatever that transformation leader asks for, the CEO has got to go to the performance zone leaders and the productivity zone leaders and say, you have to make these sacrifices because we've got to get through this transition or we're going to destroy our company. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. And how does this, um, in your experience, how have you seen, what have you seen HR's role in this and how has that affected HR? Well, so what happens is this makes people very unhappy. Just, just, and, and not just not just the rank and file unhappy. This makes mm-hmm. very senior executives very unhappy. Okay? Yeah, I knew you were going to get so, that. <laughs> so, so, so if you think about just the humanity of that, of getting through that and, and, and working through the ego, because these are, look. These are highly, these, yeah. They strong, yeah. yeah. They have strong egos. If they didn't have strong egos, they wouldn't be a senior executive, right? So you have to say, how do you align those egos and what kind of conversations? And the, one of the most important things HR can do is make sure that you surface the conversations and make sure that you have the right conversations, that they not happen under the surface, that they not happen politically offline, that you bring them to the table and you legitimize the conflicts. Look, these are real conflicts. This is not people acting badly. This is just the pressure of the event. Yeah. So are there any, within, within the work you're doing, are there any pr- practical steps or tools that, that the leaders can take now to help them take a step closer <laughs> yeah yeah I, I think the biggest thing is well there's, i think there's two two sets prior to a transformation i think that the hr function the hr function is set up rather well to manage the performance zone and the productivity zone mm-hmm. and virtually all the practices you would learn in any in any hr curriculum and whatever are fine i think the ability to manage the incubation zone it's interesting people wonder can you manage innovation really and I, I, all I can tell you is you can sure as heck mismanage innovation. <laughs> and so I think most corporations mismanage innovation. I think there are three things, they, the two, two classic ones. I think the HR can intervene in both of these situations. One is um, they'll, do, they'll, they'll have the incubation pet project of the CEO or the senior executive vice president. And the word there is just these, these, this is the new pet project, whatever it is, don't get in the way. It's like the grant, it's like the, this is the, this is the, 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 the son-in-law of the CEO. <laughs> so whatever, give it special treatment. And so they do, and they do, they give it special treatment. And a bit, but very quickly, they will put that product or offer into their performance zone to sell and it's not ready. And so it just gets destroyed. Mm-hmm. And so, so that, so the patronage approach ends up dying in the performance zone because it's, it's overprotected in its youth and then it's just thrown to the wolves. Do you think they should uh, operate as two separate businesses to some extent? Well, you, so, that's, so the second, the other way to go is, and often you do the second wave booth in acquisition. So you acquire an existing business, okay? It has its own sales force. It has its own, it's that own thing. Mm-hmm. And, and, and everybody agrees, leave it alone. Don't, yeah, we'll, just leave we'll, it alone, yeah. <laughs> so, so basically this business is now, this is how you mismanage innovation the second way, because this, that, that, but that business sort of wanders around. It, it doesn't really ever connect with the home host business very well. Eventually it, it, it is an irritant because it's, it's actually creating issues and accounts where the customer saying, well, wait a minute, which business am I dealing with? And the, you have this brand perception of being this, but this new business isn't like that. And what's going on here. 
and so it, it, it starts to create irritations and, and eventually some and then by the way the business isn't making anything like the money the way that the big business makes money and so at some point somebody says well we got to come in and manage this thing and so you know somebody from corporate comes in you know and, and they sort of smother it to death with management because it's not big <laughs> enough to be managed in that way so you say well okay well so how would you do it right i mean you know i'd be like could we, enough of the failure stuff it turns out the venture capital industry, which has a very different financial model, and that everybody gets distracted by its financial model. Ignore that. How do venture capitalists manage incubation? And they manage it brilliantly. They, 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 first of all, they, they, fund, they don't fund it annually. No, no venture capitalist ever gave a startup an annual budget. You, you fund to milestones. It's a very different funding mechanism. Then you manage it with monthly meetings, and, and there's, a, there's an executive sponsor, and, and you manage the monthly meetings toward the milestones. And you set up a real business, so it has its own sales and its own marketing, and whatever. And you build it as a startup inside. And, and 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 you have to have a certain amount of dispensation from the from the processes because you'll have a different tone of voice, maybe even a different brand image. You've got to have enough management support to say, look, this is a sub brand. We're we're trying this one out, uh, you know, as, as a different play. So the CEO it has to have support for this for this effort. But at the same time, you can't just run completely completely uh, 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 muck, And so we typically have a liaison relationship between HR and the incubation zone where the HR people say, well, okay, we have standard processes. And then the, the, the leader of the, of the incubation zone says, I need to hire a data scientist and I need to pay them 250,000 pounds a year and give them stock. And the HR person says, that's three level, that's three times what our normal hiring, you know, and salary <laughs> is. What the heck? And that's crazy. We, you can't do it. And that's where the CEO has got to say, Two things. One, we're not changing our salary schedule, HR. We believe in it. But in this one case, we are going to, in fact, let the person hire the data scientist because that's what they have to do. But that's the kind of, those are the kind of exceptions you need. It's a need. big shift. Yeah. So one of the things that I've, from what listening to everything you said, is it's 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 not only it's a shift in culture, it's a shift in the internal processes, it's a, it's a shift in the business's KPIs, it's a shift in it's a shift everywhere. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and and the point about it is it's fit for that zone. I think what happens sometimes is people say, well, that zone should take over the company. No, it should not take over the company because that zone does not work at scale. So, so it, it's really important that people honor each zone for what it is. And I think that's probably the lead that they, it's the senior HR executive has, has to do mm -hmm. is say, you know, because most of the conflict I find is, because, is, is somebody taking one zone standards and applying it to the performance of a different zone. Mm. And they just say, well, you know, this isn't fair because I have measured this way, therefore you have to be measured this way. It says, no, you're in that zone and I'm in this zone. We have different rules. Yeah. So working with all of these organizations, what have you seen to be the biggest barrier? Is it the human barrier, the element? Is it, is it really just getting this, the leadership seen on side? Is that the biggest win well, that, that needs to that, happen? That, that's what I have to say. I, compensation systems often reinforce barriers because I'm compensated. Now you're asking me to act against my compensation system uh, or, yeah. or I'm compensated to perform, to perform the wrong way. So that's the second one. I think a, a, a lot of it is, it turns out with most organizations, the top is more flexible and, and actually can often see the problem because they get a big overview of it and, and they can actually get aligned. And, and, and the new recruits coming in can kind of buy into the vision of the company and they can actually align with the top. It's the middle of the organization mm. who's been there for 10 or 15 or 20 or- The line 20. managers. Yeah, it's every, and, and the way, if you're a middle manager, if you're, if you're part of the middle of an organization, <laughs> The way you've been getting things done is you've been doing, basically you go to your friends, you say, well, I've got this new project and I need some help. And here's what, I, here's what I'm hoping you can do for me. And your friend says, sure, I, I'll, I'll do that. And, and, and then, you know, but, but I, oh, I, basically in some hidden accounting book, there's a little entry that says, Jeffrey owes Chris one favor, right? <laughs> and, and then it's like, okay. And then it goes on, you come back and ask me and I, you owe me a favor. And so there's, there's this web of favors. And the web of favors is what connects all of the middle of the organization. And so when you do these changes of direction and these sacrifices, you say, no, Jeff, you've got to take resources away from Chris and give them to Larry. And I go to you and I say, Chris, I'm really sorry. I can't. And you say, Jeff, I was there for you, buddy. I mean, come on. You <laughs> and so I'm going, well, okay, let's see what I can do. And so what I do is I just mitigate the direction enough. I, I'm, I'm trying to make you happy. I'm trying to make my boss happy. Well, the net result is, is you create inertial stasis. 
And so, and so this, is, this frustrating inertia in large corporations is due to the web of favors, which is a perfectly legitimate idea, but it resists change. Mm. And um, what, what do you think, why, why is this word innovation all of a sudden become, you know, this has been happening for centuries. <laughs> Yes. Uh, disruption, innovation. <laughs> why, why is it all of a sudden such a big? Is it because do you think it's because of media now? Because everyone can see it, and it's you know we've got you know with things like LinkedIn and Facebook and just the social media, it spreads quickly. You know, I, I, for two I, weeks, I, all I heard about was Toys R Us a few months ago. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. is, is that the reason why, or what? what why right. is it big, why is well, it there's no time? question. There's no question that we feel like, for example, the world is going because of all the media, we feel like the world's going to hell in a handbasket, although most of the statistics say this is probably the best time to be alive in the history of the planet. So, so yeah, there's a, there is a media amplification thing going on. I think the other thing that's going on, though, is the, di- this, this, the, the, the impact of cloud computing and mobile computing has created this situation where you now have about a billion and a half people who can be interacted with digitally at any time in anywhere in the world, essentially for free i mean this it, it, like a podcast yeah exactly like what you and i are doing right now so as, a result, so as a result you realize well if that's true wouldn't you redesign your business processes if you'd known that at the beginning of your business wouldn't yeah. you have built your process you wouldn't have had a call center would you you wouldn't have a waiting room in a patient a hospital would you you wouldn't really ask 25 children to sit in a room with a teacher for six hours a day would you and the answer is no you wouldn't you would redesign everything. Mm. And so what's happening, it's happening very, you know, it's happening sector by sector, is sector by sector is, is redesigning itself to be digital. And we, we've seen it happen in media and we've seen it happen in financial services and we're seeing it happen right now in retail and, it, and digital government, you can sort of see that that's coming and healthcare and education are behind, but they're all, it's all gonna happen. And so, it, it, and it's highly disruptive because all of the existing models were anchored in an old paradigm and they actually become less efficient in the new world. So they wanna resist the move to the new world. Meanwhile, the disruptor is having a, a field day because they're playing with free money, essentially <laughs> to say, I can build, I can build you know, a business on, you know, I can build Airbnb and never buy a property and never hire a property manager. It's crazy. And man. I can build Uber and I never buy a car and I never hire a driver. Mm. And you're going, well, wait, 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 that's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> and, and, and so it's, there's a lot of disruption. Yeah, it's, it is unbelievable when you think of, when you think about like that, when, or, like, when you mentioned Uber or Airbnb, even my, sometimes, and then when, when we started our companies two years ago, I wanted to disrupt the events industry. And yeah. I was like, why have we been doing the same thing over and over again for so long now? And um, we do like digital workshops yes. where before you were limited, you know, to getting two or 300 people in your local area. Whereas I do a HR analytics and virtual workshop where we have hundreds of HR analytics and leaders from all over the world joining us on this monthly workshop. And it still blows my mind <laughs> that yeah. we'll be able to do that. And I'm like, we're no longer, we're no longer limited. And, um, and, and, to, and, and it's that. great. And, and digital doesn't work for everything. I, I, no, I know you, you got married last year. I bet you didn't do it digitally. I bet you. <laughs> Although I did live stream the wedding. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. There you go. Okay, there you go. And that's it. I think. I think hybrid. I think hybrid, hybrid. models are going to be. The, the, we still do face to face events. We're not getting rid yeah. of face to face events. We're <laughs> yeah. the same, complete. People need to see each other and feel each other. Of course. <laughs> but, 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 but your but your point though is in a prior era, and I mean, the prior era being only like 10 years ago, basically, if you didn't do face events, you couldn't really make it work. I mean, yeah, you had, to, a, you had a, to do face events, yeah. The same with acad- academia, like there was a, um, a monopoly. It was like, we hold the keys yeah. to this information. And unless you go to study at university, you're yeah. not going to access this information. Yeah. And then the internet destroyed that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. very, very quickly. And uh, I'm seeing it more and more now. Um, even some of the, um, the thought leaders that I work with, you know, now the information is so uh, readily available that they also, it also disrupts them too. Um, For sure. I, I think if you were planning on having an information monopoly, which kind of, if you think about all of the information uh, provider model, the, the Nielsen's and the, and, and the Elsevier's and, the, and, and these people, they did have an information monopoly. They did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, that's, that, that's gone. 
and, and what's kind of cool about like the Khan Academy or, or, or Udacity or, or, or Singularity, these, these online universities, mm -hmm. if all you need is information, they're, they're fabulous. Um, if, you need, if you need attention, then, then, you know, we are mammals and we do need to be, you know, stroked <laughs> periodically, physically. Yeah. And so you know, there's, there's going to be plenty of jobs for teachers, but I'm hoping we can offload the, a bunch of the work onto the digital system so that we can get and better, more value work in the, in the in-person system. A hundred percent. And also to go along that digital side, people now consume content in a completely different way than they used yeah. to. You know, everyone, have, everyone has one of these. Yep. I'm, holding, I'm yep. holding up the mobile guys. Everyone has one of these, right? And the ability to, you know, for me every day on the, on the way to work, riding in, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm, I'm about all the various different topics. I'm learning on the move. I'm on the train, wherever it may be. And it's the ability to be able to do that is just... It just so just I think, crazy. by the way, that raises another HR issue, which is this concern about either the distracted worker or the digitally mm -hmm. unengaged worker. And I do think that... Um, creating uh, events where people talk with people directly and interact personally. And, and I love sharing food, uh, A, because I like to eat. Uh, but, but B, I think sharing food is an example of, it's a very concrete activity. It carries an enormous amount of emotional resonance and cultural resonance, and it builds bonds. And I think, I think it's important that, that we sort of counteract the, the, the digital isolation that that at the margin we experience when you are going to work and everybody else, not only are you on your smartphone, but everybody in the car is on their smartphone. Yeah. And, and, and eye contact is, is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> you, you only have to, I, I said it the other day as well, you only have to get on the train and look around you and every single person's on, stuck in their mobile. You know, you, you, you used to be like two or three people. Now it's everyone. Everyone's got headphones in, you know, it, well, even if you talk to someone on the street, right? I did an yeah, experiment yeah, a few weeks ago yeah. where on the way to work, I was asking complete strangers. Um, I was asking them, you know, if you, who's your best manager and why was their your best manager, right? And I was just asking random strangers. It's strange, Pete, it's strange just to go and talk to someone. Yes. yes. <laughs> In this day and age, they look at you like, oh my God, who are you? You're talking to me. Yeah. I'm like, what, what, yeah. why is that weird? <laughs> but you, you, you'll talk to a stranger on social media. You'll yeah. reach out to someone on LinkedIn. You know, you'll, you'll send someone a message on, uh, you know, Facebook. But yeah. going up to someone in public and actually saying, hi, how are you? How's your day right. going? Is now a, a strange... Well, we had we this sort of high, I think there's a divide. I think there's a high touch, low touch divide. And I think the low touch medium, Marsha McLuhan used to call them hot mediums and cool mediums. Uh, but, but the cool medium, meaning the low touch medium is one where you can, I think, make overtures because there's some sort of distancing process from the digital environment, and which, which, which a personal overture, it's like, well, are, are, you, are you a reasonable person or are you just a crazy person about to pull out, you know, <laughs> or whatever. So, so, so I, I get that. But, but I do think that we have over-rotated to the digital. I mean, I, I think, and particularly with kids. Yeah, I, oh, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, yeah. It, it, anyway. So just another place to, to look. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> you know, you see little kid free rolls on an iPad, just glued. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's, clearly, it's clearly a form of babysitting, but I'm not sure it's a good one. You know, all my friends that have kids say, they say, Chris, you always moan at me about it. Wait until you have a kid and you yeah. realize that yeah. when they're crying, you can give them an iPad on it with a little t TV show <laughs> on it and they'll stop crying. <laughs> uh, I was like, I'm going to try my best to resist. <laughs> well, it's very cool. You know, our, our kids did a thing where for the first two years, no, did, no, no screens. And I have to say that that was a very cool rule because it, it just engages them. It's a very cool rule. <laughs> yeah, I think it stills the creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up drawing and, you know, putting things together and doing like, you know, whatever, like, you know, arts and crafts and those skills that you learn, the creativity that you have to have to be able to put that together rather than just being sitting there watching a, a cartoon. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's um, I definitely agree with that. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, my, my um, nephew's five. And although he is, there's, there's fascinating things on one side. So one, you know, he can, he knows how to code because I went on a, a sort of a kid's coding course. Cool. And he's now at a level that I can't even, I don't even know what he's doing. It's code.org. <laughs> it's like a free website that was put forward by like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates. They all paid for it. And uh, I'm like, wow, he's basically making his own game, but he doesn't realize he's coding at the same time. So that's, yeah. there's a benefit there, of course. 
And then, you know, when he, he came around to my house a few, a few days ago and told me that we need to switch servers. <laughs> this, is, this is a five-year-old. Yeah, we switch servers because we were playing a game saying because that server's too busy, you know, that's North America server. We need to switch over to the EU, to the EU server on Minecraft. And I was like, did you seriously just tell me that the servers, I, it just blew my, so it's, 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 it's a different world. It's a, it's a different world we're living in right now. Well, you know, it's not technology if you're born with it. It's right? true. That's true. It's so true. It's yeah. It's, it's normal to them. It's just, it's, yeah, it's just yeah, it's a yeah. normal thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no problem. We're back to the conversation. Okay. <laughs> so, um, w- of course, you're you're. I've seen some of the organisations that you're you're working with and, and advising some huge organisations, but also um, um, the startups. Um, what 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 are you seeing? Because I'm seeing on my end that all of the big companies that I'm working with want to network with the startups, and all the startups I'm working with want to network with the large multinationals. You know, what what are the benefits that one can learn from another to help them? Well, think? so first of all, I think each one, if you think about it, the big company is largely performance zone dominated, the startup is largely incubation zone dominated. Mm-hmm. So, so there's a natural attraction because, because it's clear that, that, that each has something to give the other. The performance zone has the opportunity for scale and the incubation zone has the opportunity for novelty. And so it's great. And, and, and so I think the desire to connect is really important. And I think initially those connections are actually in general pretty positive because each one gets the positive from the other. The challenge is when you when the when this when the startup needs itself to go to scale, uh, and, yeah. and that that's when that's when the challenges happen. Uh, and and so so sometimes what happens uh, the most amicable solution is often the startup gets absorbed into the big company. It doesn't really fulfill its startup ambitions, but it does improve the existing product line. But it, it doesn't create a new product. It doesn't create a new world. It's it's just essentially a better version of an older product. Now that 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 actually uh, gets it gets an exit for the founder. So financially, that's actually quite attractive. Um, but but it, it's a little bit there's a little bit of disappointment lingering because of we had the bigger dream and we actually didn't execute. On that's the how I feel about it. every time I see a big company absorb or yeah. buy a startup. I'm like oh. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what well, I could have. I wonder what what that could have well, been. <laughs> and, and, the, and the truth is, for every for every uh, Uber or Airbnb, there are probably a hundred. Well, there are probably three hundred companies that didn't even get to get acquired, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, twenty or thirty that do get acquired. It, I think you have to realize it's a little bit like I don't know about how cricket works, but in baseball, periodically somebody hits a home run. But the truth is, if you can hit a single or get on base one out of every three or four times, that's considered pretty good. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think you have to take all the results of a portfolio. And that's, that's kind of how venture capitalists look at it. They say if we have 25 companies, if two or three get this escape velocity, that's actually quite good. The problem that a big company has when they're running their own incubation is two to three out of 25, you can't afford that. If you're, if you're a venture capitalist, you can afford it. But you can't afford that as a regular company. So it's act, that's what makes the journey so different and the pressure is so different. It's what creates all the disappointment because I think people think, well, we should be able to do what a venture capitalist can do. And the answer is no, you're not set up to do that. But they, the people who fund venture capital want to take these home run hitter chances and they're willing to strike out a lot. A lot. Uh, <laughs> you can't that inside a big company. Yeah. So how do you, I was going to ask you this earlier and I always, for me, I, I, I always had the question of how do you manage your investors in this period where really you're going to have to take, you know, three steps back to take one step forward. Um, it's, it's, what advice would you give to companies in the H- and, and of course that's going to have a big effect on HR as well. What advice would you give to companies on that? So it, it turns out that, that without the prior to having a framework for dealing with this, really the only companies that were doing successfully doing this were founder led companies where you had a charismatic founder who, who had a very strong stock position, probably effectively, didn't control the board of directors, but had a huge influence on the board of directors. Like Elon Musk type uh, of guy. Elon Musk, Mark Benioff, yeah. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> Bill Gates, Larry yeah. Ellison. You, you, just, you, know, you can name them. <laughs> if, if, on the other hand, you were a hired CEO, that you were not a founder, mm. that was where the struggling was just became very challenging. And so, so I, th- what I think you have to do is say, look, um, you have to be very principled about this and, 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 and kind of telegraph to your investors. Our industry is going through a categorical shift, and we we must 
the, our industry has to catch the next wave and we have a plan for doing that. And this is our plan for doing it, but it's gonna take a significant investment. And then in the middle of that, you often would wanna do an acquisition to accelerate the process. Uh, and, and when you do the acquisition, it creates enough question. It takes you about a year to figure out the accounting of the real accounting of an acquisition. It kind of can create some air cover, frankly, during a period where, where the numbers are going to look really grim. But if you come out of that with a viable, vibrant business, the, 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 the markets forgive you. Uh, what they don't forgive you for doing is starting and stopping. And, and, and that's what most people do. Well, I suppose the implications are we either do it or we don't have a business. <laughs> well, actually, actually, there's a third implication. You'd be surprised how long you could stretch the existing business. If, if you say, for example, look, our culture, our leadership, our board, they're just not going to sign up for this. I mean, you're the HR director. You know these people. And you go, look, they're just not going to do it. Okay, if that's true, then don't start it. And instead, just continually prop up the existing business with as much innovation as you can get into it. But don't, don't. The last thing you want to do is send a is send somebody with a physical fitness of me on a marathon, because I will just die. <laughs> so, so and, and the truth is, most organizations, if you send them on this journey, they'll just die. So don't yeah. do it. I mean, I think part of the HR senior HR director's role is to say, help the management look itself in the mirror and say, are we really ready for this? I mean, let's not let's not just use these fancy new words like digital transformation. This is like heart surgery. You know, are we really ready for this? So it sounds like really, with everything we've spoken about, it really needs to take, it takes a very courageous CEO to take on this task. I think so. And I think a, a courageous CEO who is willing, uh, it's, it's really Put weird. Put yourself on the be, line, basically. Well, exactly, exactly. You've got to be <laughs> command and control, but humble. Which yeah. is really a weird, that's a, weird a very, yeah, I'm about to say, that's, that's a very, <laughs> that's two, <laughs> <office> pulling at <laughs> two ends of the... It is. But, but you know, but really, but great leaders really, really are that. Like for example, the guy that was Captain Sully, the guy that landed the plane mm -hmm. on the Hudson River. Yeah. Yep. I mean, he had 93 seconds to get that thing down, and he just did it. Right. It was a command and control. But if you talk to him before or after, he's a very humble guy. And 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 so and Satya Nadella, who's running Microsoft mm -hmm. right now, he's he's very he's, humble guy. Yeah. yeah. And and look what he's done. Uh, yeah. And, and it, it, yeah, so Salesforce and Microsoft were the two case studies for the book. And I got to know Mark Benioff and his team and Satya and his team very well. And they're, they're both very different kinds of styles of personality externally, but both actually are humble leaders who use command and control effectively, but not all the time, just for transformational purposes. Yeah. So uh, normally on the show, I ask the implications if companies don't do this, but we kind of know that already. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I think it's important. I, I get nervous because Silicon Valley always says innovate or die. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the word. You just put yeah, that is the yeah, sentence. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the correct phrase, I think, is innovate or expect to get quietly marginalized over time. Oh, you're nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying there's a lot more time. You know, oh, you're right. Like, it wasn't oh, overnight. Yeah, by the way, as you become a parent and then a grandparent, you realize... Well, marginalized isn't all bad if I get to visit the grandchildren. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And our, um, I think the f one of the things I always thought is how do you, I'm sure you know, this is a conversation for another day, but how can companies, are there any ways that you can see ahead that you are going to be disrupted? Is there anything that you've come across where good ways of company, because it's so hard. Like how do you, you don't know, like a company could pop up tomorrow that yeah. we've never heard of and disrupt a major industry. We've seen it time and time again. So how do companies even begin to prepare for the, well, this? I, I actually don't think you have to forecast it. If you're the disruptee, and look at 99% of the people are disruptees, not disruptors. Yeah, you're hungry. Yeah, um, you know, look, Amazon, it was clear that Amazon had a viable e-commerce business in 2002. It had gone from 1% of total retail to 2% e-commerce had. And in, in the next year, it went to 4%. But the industry was still in denial. And then it went to 8%. And it was still saying, well, you know, we still have over 90% of the retails is brick and mortar. So, so part of it is not, you don't have to be like prescient. What you have to be is not, uh, not an ostrich. You can't put your head in the sand. But that's what industries were doing. And, and so I think the, the company who's willing to say, don't put our head in the sand, understand and then and then the other question i try to work with management teams on is what do you think the world wants you to do 
I mean, like, you know, there's this, this perfectly good disruptor called Amazon. They're doing something very well. So you're Macy's. So what do you think the world wants Macy's to be? And, and, and instead of saying, well, we have to do this, we have to be Amazon, or we, our spreadsheets tell us we have to have this financial return. Yeah, because that's not always the and answer, is it? Yeah. Yeah, no. What does the world want you to be? And, and, and if the world wants you to go away, then, okay, maybe that's, that's <laughs> what you do. But usually the world would say, well, if you really wanted to do what we wanted you to do, we'd like you to host pop-up stores and we'd like you to have an e-commerce kiosk and we'd like you to, you know, what, we'd like you to partner with Amazon and whatever it would be. And all of a sudden you go, oh, well, okay, so there are options. Mm. For me, the way, the way I decided as, as a co-founder of this company is looking at human behavior. So I don't look at competitors. I don't look at anything else. All I look at is human behavior. And I saw that human behavior is now on the mobile and that people are consuming content digitally and they want convenience and ease and they want to save time. They want to be able to order something and then one hour it's at the house from yeah. Amazon. You know, They want to be able to order their food on, on Uber Eats and the guy yeah. cycles your food to your office, like, which, which is what I did today. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I basically applied those principles because human behaviors don't change and, uh, or they do change, but they're on scale. And uh, yeah. I can predict that. I only need to talk to people <laughs> around yeah. me and that's how I did it. Rather than going, you know what, this company is doing really well in the events industry. Let me go and copy. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, <laughs> that's the way I work. I think, anyway, I, I think I think some industry. You know, I, I've spent a bunch of time with companies. They're either customer centric or competitor centric. And in, in in new in in new industries, or if you're doing something new, customer centric is the only thing I think that really works. That's exactly in what I'm established to industries, you can be competitor centric because you know, that can work too, but they're very different cultures. And, and you and I both have a, a customer centric business model. Because yeah. Or well, I didn't even know that was cl clarified what I was doing, yeah. <laughs> but now, well, well, I, obviously I, I knew that it was customer centric, but I never really thought, I think it's probably a good thing that I'm not thinking about it too much because if you overcomplicate and you, you try and plan too well, much, maybe if you think about yourself too much, you're not doing your work, right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, um, that leads us quite nicely on to, the quick fire round okay. <laughs> where okay. I have five questions and okay. uh, you have no longer than 30 seconds to give us some amazing answers. Are you ready? No pressure. Go. Go. <laughs> um, what was the number one thing that was holding you back um, from becoming a leader in your field? I think I didn't have permission to lead. I didn't give myself permission to lead. I didn't give my, I, I was, I was, I think I was afraid of conflict, conflict avoidant. And at some point I got over that by just saying, Jeffrey, it's not about you. Be in service to the situation and your customer. Fantastic. Um, what's the best piece of business advice that you've ever received? Uh, well, I, I think to work backward from the market need as opposed to forward from the thing that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, now you got to connect the two, uh, but there's a tendency sometimes to say, well, I, I have a hammer, you're going to be a nail. And instead kind of work backward from the problem. Great. What's one book do you'd recommend to our audience and why it could be more than one <laughs> apart from your own we're going to put your own one you're only going to be in there anyway <laughs> no i know I, in, in the world of in the world in my world um you know the, right at this lean startup book by eric reese is great for people who are start who's doing startups uh uh the, uh the the crossing the chasm book that i do yeah I, th I think that that's if you're going to be in a b2b business in tech that's probably a good one i i love clayton christensen's this is he's now an old old chestnut called the innovator's dilemma but that was mm -hmm. that was a, a very freeing book yeah so those, those might those might be three fantastic and uh what's one internet resource that you would recommend to our leaders um well, I mean, I online think, website I mean, or forum yeah or, i mean yeah. For me, for me, LinkedIn is, is my, is, is, turns out to fit my world very, very well. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I do, like, for example, when I wrote my last book, I put every chapter on LinkedIn and had people respond to it before I actually published the book. Oh, wow. And, yeah. So it's, it's really, I mean, LinkedIn, I think if you, if you take advantage of the communal aspect, not just the recruiting aspect of it, mm -hmm. I, I think it's extremely valuable. Yeah, well, that's pretty much what my entire business has been built off of, <laughs> leveraging the power of community for LinkedIn and uh, everything else. So thank you for that. And uh, what's a um, parting piece of guidance? You know, if there's one piece of advice you give to HR leaders that really are, want, are going to help their organizations go through the, the, these uh, transformations, yeah. what would that be? Yeah. I think HR divides 
into two, two disciplines. There is a compliance and regulatory discipline that's extremely important to do well. And there is an organizational development kind of co coaching kind of discipline. And, and, and I think HR leaders need to delegate the first to somebody else. I don't, I don't think that is what this, the chief HR officer should not be doing that work. That should be done by somebody that reports to them. And they should be spending time on the, on the second one. And then I think the issue around doing cultural diagnostics and trying to, to understand you know, the various value systems in a company, not the idea that everybody in the company should have the same value system, because this zone step has persuaded me that there are local cultures and it's important to have local cultures with their own distinct identities as part of a larger corporation. Fantastic. And what's the best um, place for our, our listeners to learn more about the work that you're doing uh, and get in contact it, with you? Yeah, I think going to LinkedIn is, it, it, I have a blog on LinkedIn and, and, and so um, uh, it's got about half a million followers. So it, it's, it's been going for, for, just, for a while. Just half a million. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not five, right? you're, you're, be you're modest, be modest. But, but I, I had a very funny exchange with Conan <laughs> O'Brien. I don't know if you know who Conan is. I know who he is. Yeah, I know who he is. Oh, yeah, I don't know him, but I know who he is. Well, well, he did a show once when he was saying, you know, he was, he was raging about, you know, his social media. He said, and I just got on LinkedIn. I don't even know what LinkedIn is, but here I am and I have this many followers and I'm behind some guy named Jeffrey Moore. No way. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was so cool. And, That's and, amazing. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah, but I, I, I love, I, I'm really happy to, to see how you're leveraging LinkedIn because I think there's many other people that have incredible stories to tell or knowledge or, you know, they have a, a voice that needs to be heard. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's the power of it. And look, we wouldn't be speaking right now, right? Yeah, exactly. If, if exactly. we never came across it. Exactly. Um, and, and that's, that's, the whole, that's the part of it. Well, look, you've been an amazing guest and I really appreciate you taking the time up to join us. Um, guys, make sure you head over to hrdealers.com. Um, I'll share all the show notes on episode, everything we've been talking about and a link to all of the books and resources that were mentioned. Um, apart from that, um, Jeff, thank you for joining us and uh, I wish you all the best until we next speak. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed the video, please like, comment and share so that others can benefit from the great knowledge and experience. See you tomorrow.